This podcast contains the personal stories, opinions and experiences of its speakers rather than those of Breast Cancer Now. Welcome to the Breast Cancer Now podcast, providing support and information to anyone affected by breast cancer. I'm Laura Price and I'm the host of the Breast Cancer Now podcast. I'm a food writer and author and I live with secondary breast cancer. Today we are talking to Hannah Gardner, who you may know from her Instagram handle, Real House of Hannah. Hannah lives with secondary breast cancer and is part of Breast Cancer Now's campaign to get access to the life-saving drug in her two on NHS England. You might have seen Hannah's friend Nadia Sawala talking about the campaign on ITV's Loose Women. Before her diagnosis, Hannah was a clinical trials manager and since her diagnosis, she has taken part in a trial so you'll be able to get her perspective from both sides. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Breast Cancer Now podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I know you've had multiple breast cancer diagnoses over the years, so could you start by telling us how old you were when you were first diagnosed and how you got that diagnosis? God, I was 26. Um, I was doing something really random. I was setting up a treadmill at home. Um, I tried to get myself to the gym and thought, no, let's buy a cheap and cheerful one from Argos, get it home and hopefully stick to some sort of fitness program. So um weird situation setting up a a treadmill and it turns out they're really heavy um I pulled no I thought I pulled I was being dramatic I thought I'd pulled a muscle um so I sat down and started rubbing my chest area and it was from that that I came across like an unmistakable lump and I remember thinking how have I not felt this before um yeah so it was at that point I thought, you know what, it probably isn't anything. I'm young. I, I was under the impression that having breast cancer at such a young age would take a significant family history. I was mistaken. Um, I took myself off to the GP, said I've got a lump. I mean, initially I did receive a little bit of resistance from them. They um, they said they couldn't feel anything. Um and I did something which is a little bit was a little bit unlike me back then. I pushed. I said, "Well, no, actually, it's it is there, and I, I think I might need to get checked out." And she said, "Okay." And I know that I'm quite lucky about that because some people have been sent away not once, multiple times, and really have had to push to get that referral. I didn't have to push too hard, but um, I'm glad I did say because, yeah, I ended up being diagnosed with. Um, stage 2a grade 3 breast cancer and after you know how it is initially they don't um, necessarily know the extent of things when once I'd had an MRI it showed that it was almost 10 centimeters big so to think that someone said they couldn't feel that lump Mm. and to think I had never felt it just goes to show that I was neglecting to check myself that reminds me of when I first found my lump which was in January 2012. I went to the doctors as well and said, I've got a lump here. And they said, no, that's your rib cage. Oh my God, your rib cage. And I said, okay, that might be my rib cage, but there is a lump there. Feel feel a bit more, make a bit more effort. And then they were like, oh yeah, there is a lump. There, so you just have to push back. Cancer, so mm. yeah. So you were 26 then. Did you have chemotherapy, surgery, yeah. the works? The, the works, exactly. The full shebang, I had a mastectomy. I had a lymph node clearance, which really made me nervous at the time um, with the whole lymphedema risk. That's something that really played in my mind. Um, And then chemotherapy. I didn't have radiotherapy back then, actually. I had chemotherapy and then started tamoxifen. You've mentioned in the past that you weren't actively checking your breasts. Did you feel you were taken seriously when you were taken to the doctor, when you went to the doctor? So initially, I, I feel... Because I well, we know now that it was a 10 centimetre lump and it was mixed with um, DCIS and IDC. So it wasn't all invasive cancer, about two centimetres of it was. Um, yeah, to know that it was 10 centimetres big and that it was really palpable and big enough for me, someone who thought that I probably wouldn't have breast cancer to go and get myself. I still got myself checked. It worried me that much for them to say they couldn't feel it. Um, I feel was a bit of resistance and maybe I don't know what it is because we we do hear the story quite often um, with younger women and you know I don't know if it's because the words rare have been thrown out but, but it's is it rare I mean as a standalone figure I think the statistic is quite 
you know, significant enough that, you know, younger women are affected by breast cancer. But yeah, so I don't I don't know what it is that that they'll see a young person in front of them, but perhaps have some sort of bias. I don't know what it is. Um, But yeah, I did feel that there was a little bit of resistance, but I pushed back. I'm quite proud of 26 year old me that normally would have listened to a doctor and thought, you know, everything fine. I should be on my way. But no, I I, um, went with my gut and said, look, I'm, 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 I'm worried. I think it just needs a little bit of further investigation. Absolutely. Yeah. You should be proud of 26 year old you. Yeah. you know for advocating for yourself and also I always sort of feel the need to point out that I I think I've heard over the years lots of women saying I have a lump do I should I be and I've been told it's nothing should I be going back should I be going back um and of course in a lot of cases it is it is just a cyst and it's not it's not cancer so I also don't want to scare people but I think sometimes it's that balance isn't it yeah I think sometimes when you when you have that feeling or if you've allowed time to go by and you still feel it there, then yeah. maybe that's the time to go back and, and get a, another I agree. check. So your story is very similar to mine in that you were diagnosed with secondary breast cancer almost 10 years after your primary diagnosis. How did you find out your cancer had spread? Of course, so um, I've been diagnosed with, um, well, I've been told you have cancer from zero Um four times now so I didn't go straight to a secondary diagnosis um after my primary in 2013 I was diagnosed with a recurrence in my chest wall a few years later which is when I ended up um having a mis- well I had a wide local excision because I'd already had a mastectomy um and ended up completely flat so I wear a prosthetic on my left and I had more Surge, surge, sorry, more surgery, more chemotherapy, and then I had radiotherapy and different um, hormone therapy. And then despite that second bout of treatment, it came back again, and this time it was under my arm. Um, so I had more treatment then. I didn't have chemotherapy. They said at the time that um, it might not be worth it because you don't seem to, it's not, it doesn't seem to have worked in the past, Um Maybe it's not worth it. And I didn't know how comforted I felt by that at the time, but I did have surgery to remove it and radiotherapy. But yeah, it was in June 2022 that I was told the cancer is in your liver. And yeah, it was really... it. <sighs> Despite having been told you've had cancer before, this it hit completely different, knowing that, well, knowing full well that it's incurable and that, you know, it's life limiting. Um, it was a lot to take in. And I'd, I felt that the very thing I'd been trying to outrun for years, because once you have breast cancer, primary cancer, you, you know, treatment might finish but the worry can continue and it's it's traumatic for for various reasons but there's also that kind of cloud that um you know you live under um that makes it sound like life's all doom and gloom you can have a lovely wonderful life but for me there was always a niggle that it might come back and if it does come back is it going to be stage four and then it happened Mm. it happened and it happened when my daughter was two years old and it sucked. It really sucked. <laughs> I'm sitting here nodding my head because I understand so well all of those feelings of having breast cancer and always wondering and worrying that the worst could happen and then the worst happens. And I think our worst happened within weeks of each other because mine was so early weird. July 2022. How strange and is yours that? was June. And I remember at the end of June, I think it might have been the 30th of June, was when Deborah James, Dame Deborah James yes. died. Yes. And so I was approaching my diagnosis and all we could see on the TV were these constant updates of Deborah getting sicker and sicker and we were seeing her death on TV and it really, really resonated with me because I felt that I had this diagnosis coming. I can imagine our summers of 2022 were quite similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was very hot that laughs. summer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was hot. How how did you feel that that summer? If you can, I recall? just I was gutted. I was absolutely gutted, and I was also angry at myself. I mean, we always talk about cancer not just affecting the person who's going through it; it affects you know 
people around them. You have this radius spins out and the diameter is encircling family, loved ones, friends. And um, yeah, I'd caught up my little girl in all of it. There she was at the epicenter of it. And it's that whole thing of, you know, cancer doesn't just affect you physically, it affects you emotionally, mentally, financially, it affects your home life, your work life. And that doesn't end when your life ends. That remains for those very close to you for a long time. And I just hate the fact that my daughter is going to experience that. You know, she doesn't deserve to be robbed by cancer, you know, robbed of a mum. And the love, protection, um, comfort that we give to our children as mothers, you know, she deserves the world. What what are you angry at yourself for? That she won't have a mummy to take her to the park like all our other friends will. I think it's that, you know, she's innocent in all of this. And, yeah, I know, well, I you know, I'm logical. I know it's not my fault, but I can't help but feel guilt that yeah. she's entangled in all of this. And, yeah, and that's just the reality of secondary breast cancer that children... Well, you know, partners, mums, dads, sisters, brothers, colleagues, we're all affected. But it just, it gets me when, you know, innocent mm. kids that perhaps can't comprehend what's happening, don't have that understanding. And yeah. What is it like being told you have secondary breast cancer when, when you have such a young child? Yeah, just looping back to before, it's just gutting. It's heartbreaking. I am really sad that just a little person is potentially not going to have a parent and yeah it really it gets me she me she's my absolute world and like it's it works both ways because yes I'm sad because of that impact that might come but equally like she is my reason like the light of my life <laughs> the best thing that has ever happened to me when I had primary breast cancer I'd always have this image of wading through like a slurry of shit like you know, like this river wading through it but I'm going to get to the other side so as rubbish as it is I need to keep moving forward one foot in front of the other and I will get to the other side and get through it with a metastatic breast cancer I don't feel like I'm gonna get out onto a bank and it's mm. not going to be over so I'm kind of in this little bit of a crap situation but I can step into the pools of joy. I can find the joy every single day, find a reason to laugh, smile, and just to, you know, be me, be the essence of me, you know, because I'm not, cancer is a huge part of my life and that's inevitable because of being in and out of the hospital and taking, being on active treatment. But, you know, I'm still Hannah and I'm still Lila's mum and, yeah, I still want to live life. And Lila brings about so many you know, moments of you know, those glimmers that see me, see me through. Yeah. And how do you juggle with motherhood with your treatment and your illness? The fatigue is, that's what gets me. And I've been dodging um, chemotherapy, like Neo in that end scene in Matrix for about nearly two years now. And it's because having had it before, we know that it does wipe you out, at least for those first few days. And then a little bit later on, but you can bet your ass I'm going to keep going for as long as I can because I don't want her to you know I'm not going to run myself into the ground but yeah I, I she, yeah I'm going to keep going I yeah. will yeah and she's going to be able to see how much you are doing for her and caring for her as well <laughs> yeah kids notice these things even if they're three <laughs> so. <laughs> I hope so so um, I'm going to do a memory box a big old memory box with lots of different bits and pieces very favorite photos and I've been trying to think, what would I, what kind of questions have I asked my mum over the years? Well, my mum's not here anymore, so I have questions that I might want to ask her now as an adult. But growing up, what kinds of things would I want to know about, not just about me, but, you know, how I think and how I might advise or um, essays, bits of writing, photos, yeah. I, I don't have biological children. I've got stepchildren, but I did experience a similar similar Absolutely. thought when I was diagnosed that how have I, I've brought myself into their lives 
and I will bring the pain oh. into their lives as well. And I, so I have experienced totally that to resonate. some extent, probably different from no, what I you've don't experienced. Think but it's, it's um, hard. But I also do very much know that it's not my fault. Yeah. And I also do very much know as... Uh, reassured by my wonderful husband that they would all much rather have me in their lives Same and way. have the pain and the, and the loss and the anguish of yeah. what we're all going through together Beautiful. than not have us in their lives. And I'm sure it's the same yeah, for my your family. So. The same, I know, I yeah. know. But yeah, and then came hope. Hope did come. We think, look, there are loads of different treatment options. Let's get cracking and see how I get on. Um, so I started... Palbo Cyclib, um, which is similar. It's one. It's a sister drug of Ribocyclib, yes. yeah, which I'm on, yeah. Um, and well, I think I started to panic quite early on because after three months I wasn't responding. So um, I moved on to another drug, Cape Cytobin. Um, I got six months out of it, wasn't responding. Um, well, I did. I had one one scan. Um, that was um, stable. But yeah, so after six months, that's when I started looking at um, a clinical trial, um, Serena One. And I joined that in June of last year. 2023. 2023. So how, how do you get on a clinical trial and what does it involve? So I got on the trial because my team suggested it, but I'd always said from the off that I am interested in clinical trials. And that's, I think that's one of the most, because I've been asked about, because I used to work in clinical trials. I was a clinical trial manager. Um, I worked on later phase treatment trials. So at that point, you're kind of looking to see whether or not the experimental treatment is better than the standard of care. So there's a comparison, but um, lots of trials in that we'd be looking at as metastatic patients are earlier phase, which means that you're going to get the drug. They're not comparing at that that's, point they're testing it in smaller groups of patients to have a look at the safety and any side effects um but yeah they said that there's a trial available um it's a bit of a gamble because of it being early phase they're testing it in one or two patients then opening up other slots so there's no guarantee as to when space might become available and it was at that point I said, look, I really want to go for it. I mean, that's adding an extra treatment line. I think of them like Mario lives. Like if I can <laughs> add an extra life, um, maybe it will keep me around that little bit longer. I love that analogy. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Anything to do with Nintendo, I'm on it. Yeah. Um, One up. <laughs> yeah. And um, I waited. I said, look, let's let's try Tamoxifen again. I'd had it before, but it'd been like eight year, oh, years since I'd taken it. I thought maybe my cancer's mutated enough to forget how to respond to um, tamoxifen. So that covered me for six weeks. And then they scanned me quickly and said, yeah, you've progressed. So we're closer to when you might be able to get onto the trial. And yeah, I, I got through the eligibility criteria. And that's one thing to remember. It's not necessarily it's not easy getting onto a trial for a variety of reasons and you know up and down the country they're not distributed equally it's almost unavoidable but it's it is a bit of a lottery as to what might be available where you are and you know whether or not you're able to travel to a hospital that is running the trial um there's also you know on paper say yes you're you're a candidate for this trial but then it will involve pre-investigations and those can throw up anything you might get a te blood test result or an echo um, scan result that shows something that f makes you fall into the exclusion criteria um, but yeah the gamble paid off I got onto the trial and I got six months out of the um, Serena trials on arm K which was ribocyclib and the um, camivestrant so um so what so the, so on the trial they put they, they put you on a combination of drugs yeah so the, the trial drug was so the, the serena trial there's lots of serena trials they're testing camivestrin that's the name of the drug okay and um they're doing it in combination with other drugs right so i was on arm k so it's got so this is i think it's similar to a mams trial and that it's got different 
arms, several different arms testing different things. Mm-hmm. So this combination, they, they've had a ribocyclib, uh, sorry, I was on the ribocyclib. They have a ribocyclib um, with camivestrin combination and then they have a palbocyclib mm. with um, camivestrin combination and so on and so on. And how did it work for you during those six months? It was fine because I'd been on a CDK four six inhibitor before. You know that they're quite that's ribocyclib and palbocyclib. Yes, yeah, I'm, and I'm so bemcyclib. Used to this yeah. <laughs> one thing I will say, they're definitely one. Another, I'm going off on a tangent here. They're not chemotherapy, no. and I say that because I've been talking to people about trials um, a fair bit online, and it's quite common for a trial to stipulate that you can't have had more than two lines of chemotherapy or similar, like one or two lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. And people say, well, I can't. Well, that's me out then because I've had I've had palbocyclib and I've had um, capecitabine. Well, no, because it's not classed that. And that's something that I would advise people to really get to grips with the type of cancer they have and the treatment that they've had they've had already and to ask questions if they're not sure just to make sure that they're not dismissing anything that might actually be good for them I've gone off on a tangent I do this quite often here sorry (laughs) just just on that tangent it's a a little bit of a technical thing but anyone who's on palpocyclib or ribocyclib the pharmacist at my hospital which is one of the best hospitals in the country for cancer thinks that ribocyclib is a chemotherapy drug and it is not and my oncologist says it is not um but it is very easy for you to be confused when the medical professional is telling you Absolutely. the wrong thing. Absolutely, and you does Google happen. it as well. It will say it's not a traditional chemotherapy, which makes it sound like it is. Yeah, and it's that kind of thing that you know it upsets me. And someone says, "Oh well, no, you might have been you might have mm. been eligible had you asked the question at that point." So, what was the reason you were taken off the trial after six stopped months? Stopped working. So it worked, but then it stopped working. Yeah. So my first scan stable, second scan stable. Third scan, my um, oh, my tumor mets started to grow, and they're quite chunky now. So, um, I'm, yeah, again, that anxiety kind of creeps in about mm. it. But I, I am remaining positive. I'm now on a different combination of drugs, exmestane and everilimus. So I find out in a couple of weeks whether or not um, they're working. Fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah, we will. Yeah, everything crossed for you. How, how just going back to the clinical trial, how did it feel to be told, and actually you've had this multiple times, to be told that one of those lives, one of those Mario yeah. lives wasn't working for you? It starts to get boring after a while. <laughs> You're like, cut me a break. I would quite like to feel safe for a little while. Um, I will say, though, the being scanned every eight weeks is intense. There's no real, you you. you, you have your scan, it's okay. And then you're like, right, you carry on with your life. And then you find yourself back in, in the CT scanning room um, before you know it. And having worked in clinical trials <laughs> and then being on one, did do you think that affected your perspective of it? Did, you, did it make you, because you seem to me quite realistic in the way you talk about your cancer and your treatment and your life and everything. Did it make you, did it affect your your experience of being on a clinical trial, having known about it from the other side? No, it was weird, but it didn't affect anything. It, what it did mean is that I could have a good look at the protocol before, uh, when, I, when I was considering going on it, I could have a good read and um, perhaps make sense of things um, that given that they're actually not complicated if you're doing it all the time I'm not making out as if I'm some font of knowledge but you know I was able to understand what it was trying to do and have a good look and you know make a really informed decision but an oncologist and a trials team should be able to help anyone with that um no it didn't affect anything but yeah it, it, it felt strange being on the other end and willing myself to be eligible for mm. a trial after being part of a team writing eligibility criteria wow. and, and documentation. It's really, yeah, it's bizarre. How did you get into that in the first place? And was that something you were doing prior to the first diagnosis before you were 26? Yeah, yeah, no. So I was working, I fell into it. It sounds one of those cliches, but I really did fall into it. I started off as a trials assistant, which is bottom of the rung, and worked my way up to data manager, to clinical trial manager. And yeah, yeah. I, I loved it. It was it was great. It was really interesting. It, I worked on a, a on a, a famous well um, c- 
cancer trial called Stampede, a prostate cancer trial. Um, so I would be collecting data on things like Zolidex and um, Doxytaxel, which are drugs used in <laughs> treatment for breast cancer, again, which is just, I find very, very strange. Um, yeah, um, weird one. Changing topic slightly, you have done some underwear modelling, including after your surgery. Has breast cancer changed the way you feel about your body? At the beginning, absolutely. Oh my God, when I first was told I couldn't have reconstruction because my second diagnosis was a lump on top of my um, reconstructed breast. And, well, it was two lumps, and annoyingly, they were quite far away from each other. So I needed this wide local excision, they called it, and um, a massive flap of skin was removed, leaving no room for an implant. And they said, we'll come back to it later, if we can. And when we did have that conversation later on, um, it was a no. Um, and then when I had it again, because I persisted, it was it would be very, very difficult and involve multiple operations but yeah I found losing a breast entirely and having to wear a prosthesis um yeah I, I you know I was how old was I I was 30 that's pretty young mm. to I mean you've not long you know you grow up and your body changes you know women's bodies change and you kind of finally get to a place of acceptance and then cancer comes along and changes changes everything up again you know oh god so I went from not only that twice had the mastectomy got used to that and then like no that one's got to go now um yeah I found it hard I I didn't I didn't feel as though it's quite a normal experience for someone my age but this was through trying to come to a place of acceptance I got there I was like Do you know what my you know, femininity isn't defined by boobs or hair. It's an energy. And, you know, there's loads of that here. I don't wear the standard prosthetics that you get from the NHS. You know, I tend to wear like colourful ones. And I've got a leopard print one that I'm very fond of. Just found ways of making it fun and adding a bit of my personality. And, yeah, I continue to model. At first, I called up Marks and Spencers and I said you know what I don't know if I can do this anymore I've just had my breast removed and I thought to myself what the hell am I doing these are bras designed for women they're pocketed to you know hold a prosthesis what am I doing saying that I can't do this anymore I am the target woman so I'd be doing myself and others like a service like running away from that and hiding myself um so yeah I, I carried on and yeah, I've got to that place where I'm just like, you know what, it's not ideal. I don't look at it and think, yay, um, I don't like it, but I don't actually care. It's the least, and it's the least of my worries nowadays. Mm. Um, but I've never shown my scars, but I have very much shown myself. I think that's re those are really good words for someone else who might be in the situation of hating their body or thinking that they look bad and, it's you know, not hard. liking the way they look after surgery or even not having had surgery is the find your personality and just do like what is what feels right for you what and what feels, feels right good and you. what you like the look of and yeah yeah it's very courageous to to do the modeling and oh, share that you. for other women because um you know do you know what I've been well I say I, it doesn't feel courageous but I remember there was these images I think it might have been in it was they were in no it was online but it was like a, a newspaper website and this woman, she'd had reconstruction, but she just did this, the most beautiful photo shoot. And, you know, you, you do sometimes get these quite, I don't know, back in the day, because we've been, we were diagnosed a long time. I, the images I'd see were quite, not sad, but, you know, they're kind of demure and, mm. you know, showcasing the scar, but in a kind of sad way this woman was owning it she was in her moment looking gorgeous and powerful and like she didn't care and I looked at these I thought yes look at her she's beautiful and confident and happy it doesn't have to be the end of any of those things and yeah so I took I, I t and I still you know because I, like I say I don't show my scar and I think that's for s several reasons um 
But I, yeah, I still, when I see others sharing their scar- scars in these beautiful photos, it really does, it, it still helps me, mm. you know, that sense of solidarity and, you know, because we do hide, it's weird, it's strange that we can go, I, well, we wear these things and we can't tell who and who isn't in the same boat as us. So it's the only way really on yeah, like these images. You, that made me think actually, uh, like to look at you, on the tube or wherever, no one would ever know yeah. you have secondary breast cancer. I just you... thought, yeah, I offered my seat to someone on the way here as well. So did I, yeah, actually. I thinking, yeah, I looking around, like, look at all you lot <laughs> sitting around here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I didn't say any of that. I was like, gave, gave the guy the seat, but I was like, look, you don't, yeah. It, it made me think, because this is something that has occurred to me a lot as a secondary breast cancer patient. Um, and sometimes you do need that seat on the tube because you're exhausted uh, or you're in pain or whatever. Yeah. But people don't know that to look at you because you look no. young and you look you look well, as they say. How do you juggle that thing of 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 not looking outwardly like a secondary breast cancer patient, but inwardly feeling all that stuff that you feel? Do you tell people, do you introduce it or do you do you hide it in certain settings? Looking well, but not being well. It's an invisible illness. An invisible basically. illness. So when I was first diagnosed, when I was young, I found it really confusing being told I looked well mm. whilst having chemotherapy. I remember going to a makeup workshop actually, and um, the lady running it said to me, "Are you one of the um, makeup artists?" And that might sound like a lovely thing to be mm. asked, but at the time I was like. Okay, then, so I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I'm not sick. Maybe I'm not, maybe these these things aren't for people like me. But I was in the middle of chemotherapy with my boob completely cut off, mm. you know, uh, and I was having those thoughts. Well, switching uh, topic slightly, let's talk about Breast Cancer Now's open letter to get access to the NHER2 drug on the NHS in England. This is a drug that is relevant for women whose cancer is referred to as HER2 low. Would you be able to explain to me what HER2 is for anyone who isn't familiar? So we talk about breast cancer as being, uh, we talk about estrogen, progesterone and HER2. So these are things that a cancer can express. Um, lots. If you're hormone, hormone positive, you're expressing either of the hormones And if you are HER2 positive, your cancer is expressing the HER2 protein. This is a post-recording note. HANA means that breast cancers can contain receptors that may react to the hormones estrogen and progesterone and the protein called HER2. For more information on receptors in breast cancers, visit the Breast Cancer Now website or go to the link in the show notes. Now back to HANA. Before, if you were HER2 low, you'd be classed as HER2 negative. You'd be treated the same as patients who are HER2 negative. But in HER2 has found a way of targeting um, cancer for people who are HER2 low. So it's really exciting. It's almost like a new category. Um, And it's been described as game changing. So it's basically where we talk about her too, there's a scale and you can, if you're high on that scale, then you're, you you would have her septin or yes. know, her too treatment. Yeah. But if you're very low on that scale now, there is a drug called in her too, which would help you. Basically. Yes. Yes. And you're in that category. Yes. A lot of us. A lot of us. Yeah. And what would this drug in her too mean to you? Well, do you know what? So going back to when I was diagnosed, June 2022, that is when the trial um, that shared the results on in her two in her two it's in, the, in her two in her two um, <laughs> low patients um, was presented at ASCO, which is a big day in the clinical trials um, calendar. Um, so I'd heard that this drug had got a standing ovation, and I said to my oncologist at the appointment where I was diagnosed, I said, "Oh, yeah, in her two, I, we were calling it TDXD then." I was. I said, do you think that will become available soon? And she said, yeah, yeah, it should do, it should do. Years later, what is happening? It's not available still. It's been approved, I think, in over 30 countries, including Scotland. Um, as you know, That was quite recent. But um, yeah, it got a standing ovation because the results were that impressive. You know, it significantly improves outcomes and that's both time to progression um, and overall survival, that's like living longer um, compared to standard chemotherapy. So 
it's very promising. It's really exciting, but it's less exciting because it's not on the table. Um, it's not approved at the moment. Why do you think it is not being approved in England? I think it's not been approved yet because of money. And that's not saying someone's holding back money. I think they're negotiating a deal at the moment. Um, that's NHS England and the drug company. But I think it could possibly be deeper than that. I mean, we talk about NHS capacity. You know, can they afford the extra chair time and appointments? It's it's quite a scary situation when you start thinking about, you know, really thinking about why it's not been approved yet. But when you have a drug that is this a treatment, that's this imp you know impressive in terms of its results and its clinical benefit, you know, it, it would it would be the opposite of the advancement of cancer care and outcomes if we didn't approve it. So I do think it will be approved. Um, yeah, I just think there's a bit of politics and bargaining in between times. But unfortunately, during that time, there's people desperately waiting. And um, yeah, that, that scares me because if my next scan is isn't good news. If in her two was on the table, that would be what I have next. But if it's not, I'd be having something that's been proven to be less effective. Your friend Nadia Swala went on Loose Women to speak about this amazing campaign and how if you simply lived in Scotland, you could have access to this amazing drug. How does it make you feel that if you lived in a different postcode, you could potentially see this huge difference to your life and your disease yeah. progression after that next scan? It's not good, is it? No. But then... To be fair, there is a postcode lottery in terms of breast cancer care for loads of different reasons. Like I know people who struggle to get scans on time and scan results mm. on time. Um, so I've been quite lucky until now. Um, yeah, it, it's not good. I think it's just the nature of things. But yeah, it's not fair. We all deserve the same access to, to drugs up and down the country. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I had people offering me rooms in Scotland. I don't know if that's illegal, but, um, I will, I will, I, I will do it. <laughs> well, that would, that would certainly run through yeah. my head would be, well, I'll move to Scotland. Get myself up to the beats and why not? I mean, if that was possible, I, I, I wouldn't blame someone for having that line of thought. I mean, it's life, our lives are on the line. Why, why would you not think about it? Um, it's just a shame that it would take that. Yeah, and yeah. It also it's not as easy as that. Just Probably moving. not, no. They'd be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> That's not your address. In the open letter to NICE, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and as well as NHS England and the drug company Daichi Sankyo, which I probably haven't pronounced correctly, <laughs> you and a group of other women with secondary breast cancer talk about how you are mums, daughters, friends, sisters and grandmothers. What do you hope will be the impact of showing the real human face of patients like you who are denied the drug in her to? That they'll get a move on and sign a deal. We're waiting. Help us out here. Do the right thing. Do what Scotland have already done. Um, that's what I hope. I hope that they do the right thing. They're, they're a pe we are, we're not just numbers. We are people with lives that we are so desperate to continue living. I mean, as Lila's mum, my daughter's called Lila, um, I don't want to miss any, like, one more kiss, hug, first, first anything, like, you know, sports day, Marvel film, whatever. I don't want to miss one more of those than I need to. And if this drug can bring me, well, it's been, you know, has the potential to bring about extra life, then, yeah, I, I want that for me and I want it for all the other women too. Mm. And what what responses have, have have you had from that letter? Apparently, they they have they have made some phone calls between themselves, um, and that's the last I've heard of it. They've been asked for comments and stuff, but nothing so far. There was we did wonder um, if something had been put in place and just hadn't been you know um, announced yet because there might be an embargo in place and that's why they've gone quiet that's the hope that's being positive so yes we haven't heard much since then but we will keep pushing yeah the final decision is set to come about in i think six weeks time okay we'll just keep everything crossed yeah 
A few weeks after that conversation with Hannah, we caught up with her again via phone for some updates on the campaign. So, Hannah, we are meeting with you again a few weeks after we recorded that episode um, because, unfortunately, you did get the results from your latest scan, which weren't brilliant, and I'll, I'll let you fill the listeners in on that. And at the same time, the same week, we also heard that the inher 2 drug has been rejected in England. So um, could you just talk to us about, give us a bit more detail on both those things and the impact that that is having on you? So, yeah, I don't think what it is, but every time with a scan, I go in really hopeful and it's only been... I don't even just started it, so I thought, odds on, you get a little bit of time with this drug working. <laughs> but no, um, it wasn't working. So Everolimus and Eczemus stain, after three months, um, my scan showed that my cancer was still growing despite taking it. Um, and I, for me, it was really quite a scary scan result because my lung met is actually stable which is great, um, but my liver, on the other hand, is not stable. It is really starting to kick off there. I've now got four tumours, which are, well, the last I heard, I'd had, I had two and one small one. They're all quite sizable now. I've got four and loads of little spots showing up on the scan. So things feel a bit hairy at the moment. And I knew going into this scan that, had things gone to pot um, in terms of the cancer growing, I would be looking at in her two next. So to have the double whammy <laughs> that no, in her two isn't going to be on the table, and yes, your cancer has grown. Um, yeah, a real sucker punch, and I'm smiling, but I don't feel. Yeah, it's been a very difficult couple of weeks. It's been a whirlwind. It's been been lots of heartache lots of confusion um yeah it isn't what I wanted but this is the reality I guess of of stage four cancer it's completely unpredictable I won't be the only person feeling this right now um but I'm just I am I'm, I am quite I'm beyond frustrated I'd say angry but I'm too tired to be angry or well, maybe I am um, I'm just really, yeah, I'm frustrated that in her two is off the table and that's really niggling me because it doesn't feel right and it's not sitting well. Yeah. Hannah, I'm so sorry that you've had this double devastating news. I, you know, being a fellow stage four patient, yeah. I can understand that sick to the stomach feeling that you must have had with both of those bits of news and it is just I don't want to swear on this podcast but it's just it's, I know it's de so devastating Winded. for you <laughs> and you said that you're not the only person feeling this but you are actually the only person well the main person who's become the face of a national campaign which thanks to Breast Cancer Now thanks to your amazing friend Nadia Swala you have managed to speak with politicians, you have managed to go on Loose Women, Lorraine, um, various live TV shows. Could you just tell us what you've been doing in the last couple of weeks to try and push this and her two drug through and get it available for you and many, many others? So you mentioned my beautiful, incredible friend Nadia there. Um, no questions asked, no hesitation has just really... I feel almost like she's taken it on when in, in a few moments where I've not been able to because I've been sitting back thinking, God, processing this news. And she's like, right, what can we do? My friend Helen, the titty gritty, has been instrumental in a lot of what's been going on as well. And we've had our lovely Kaz on board too, who I love to pieces. Both Kaz and Helen are um, breast cancer um, survivors too. Um, yeah, we've just... They've been pitching left, right and centre. I'm really, I'm very lucky that we've got them because um, I don't think some of these things would have come about. So that isn't lost on me. And you mentioned me being the face. I'm such an awkward face of anything. Like I'm like this reluctant face. But if it's landing, if me being vulnerable, which I'm actually not really that comfortable with doing, and I'm glad that I've started really sharing that, that side of 
um, the unfiltered side of stage four breast cancer and the realities because I think it's landing. It's we're, we're all human at the end of the day, and if it's pricking up the ears of people who have the power to make these decisions, then I will keep on going, and we will keep talking to the press, and we will keep shouting about it. Um, and I, I, I know I'm not the only one. You know, I'm not the only one. You have the brilliant campaign. Those of us are involved with it. There are people sharing the petition far, far and wide. It's I don't know how many signatures it's got there. Yeah. Must be Last time I looked, it was about 150,000 signatures. Wow, yeah, this so is the Breast is. Cancer Now uh, petition, which we'll put a link to in the show notes. Yeah. And it just shows that it is connecting with people, not just in the eye of the storm, but people outside of it are seeing that this isn't fair. It's not right that 45 countries across the world have this approved as standard of care. We deserve the same quality of standard of care. We deserve the extra time. The, the hope of extra time that this drug brings about. So, um, yeah, we're just doing our part, whatever we can to, to um, yeah, to, to keep, keep up that pressure. And we did speak to um, Craig Tracy MP, who is the chair of the APPG, oh, that's a mouthful for me, the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Breast Cancer, who is aware of the issue. And I know he actually works with Breast Cancer now a fair bit across these issues. And we met with the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Morden, who seemed really, you know, engaged with the issue. Um, it was brought up, so hopefully, brought up in Parliament, hopefully that means that you know, we're moving forward in the right direction to perhaps get those parties, the parties being NHS England, NICE, the drug companies, around the table and just getting a deal done because, you know, time is of the essence. And the truth is, it's probably too late for me this time round, but I'm, I'm not going to stop because it's not fair. You said that you are a reluctant face of this campaign. Actually, you've spoken brilliantly publicly about it and it's so important Thank that you, you. have. Um, the, there's an image that I think Breast Cancer Now are using of you and your little girl, Lila, um, which has been served to me on uh, when I've been on social media. Um, which, you know, I understand from speaking to you on this podcast how important it is for you to spend more time with your little girl do you, you said it might be too late for you in terms of in her too. I don't necessarily believe that. I still have hope that this is going to change. And this is a very fast moving um, situation at the moment. And, it, you know, by the time this podcast come out, it may be that more changes have happened. But if you're able to speak about it, is there another drug? Is there another plan that your oncologist is talking about at the moment to to help you? So if it does get approved, who's to say that my next line of treatment if it fails maybe that's when in her two might come in so there, there's that it's just this time but I don't actually have a plan I have a conversation with um my oncologist later today I'm actually going in tomorrow so I think maybe today is going to be the prepper you know giving me an idea of the, putting the feelers out and then tomorrow I should have something in place and it's only been two weeks I know it can feel like a long time, can't it, between treatments? But you know, treat that—that's what the flush out of my current treatment would be anyway. I've not lost any time. I need to. This is what I tell myself so that I don't drive myself wild, thinking I'm off treatment and it's growing. Um, nothing will have happened in that time. Well, nothing significant. Um, but yeah, I—I—I I, I don't know. It could be, could be looking at trials it could be looking at chemo a more standard because there are plenty i've told there are plenty of other chemos it's just for me really upsetting that we've got something that's better out there and i can't have it now whilst i'm most well um yeah yeah it, yeah i have no doubt that everyone listening to this podcast will want to do anything they can to help just as your friends Nadia and your and your other friends have have been my doing. little girl gang, I love them so much obviously <laughs> they're like the aunties and big sisters I've never have and it had never had they've been so on board and 
know Nadia has been collabing with breast cancer now and it's just it's just been brilliant to have someone with that platform you know stand with us and I know she'd do it she'd, she'd say sharp of course I'll do it um but <laughs> no I mean and also just you know the fact that you know Nadia who is a celebrity who has this massive platform who is on Loose Women which is an incredibly powerful show that's been going for over 20 years you know a, a cele- not every celebrity would use their celebrity and their platform to do something like this so the fact that they have done this is amazing and this campaign wouldn't necessarily have gone so far wouldn't necessarily have you wouldn't necessarily be able to speak to those politicians without that support so you yeah. as the patient and the face representing all these other people around the around England and elsewhere I'm sure teaming up with Nadia who has the platform and then teaming up with Breast Cancer Now which has this additional platform and all the knowledge is an knowledge. incredibly powerful thing. So there is a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot of hope in that. For anyone listening who wants to help, what should be their course of action now? Should they be writing to their MPs, signing the Breast Cancer Now petition? What can they do? Exactly those. I think writing to your MP, but I'd also say sign the petition. Sign and share the petition so that we can show those involved how many people are really behind this and want to see that change made. Um, It doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is. More signatures, the better. We will put the link to Breast Cancer Now's petition in the show notes, and it's incredibly quick and easy to sign. Um, But in terms of writing to your MP, a lot of people won't have done that before. How do you write to your MP? So I, I... How I wrote to my MP was I went online, I found the constitu- her constituents website um, there and I, I, I just put subject line saying urgent breast cancer, um, breast cancer drug approval in her too and I just laid it out and I said a, a, a drug, again, a drug described as game changing called in her too has been rejected for use on the NHS. I had some links to articles and I said that um, I'd really love to have a conversation with you about this and to have your support. There may well be some suggestions out there, Laura, about what exactly MPs can do, but they can probably be asked to approach Craig Tracy, again, who's that chair of the Breast Cancer um, Committee. I just wanted to ask you that because I think a lot of people, you know, haven't haven't yeah, just ever written to their MP. So yeah, yeah it's grab um, attention with the with grab attention with the subject line. The more people who get involved in this campaign, whichever way they can get involved, whether it's writing to the MP, whether it's signing the petition, or also sharing that petition, and particularly if you are a person hearing this podcast who has a big platform on social media, whether that's a thousand followers, five hundred followers or you've got hundreds of thousands of followers, please share the petition, share this podcast episode, share Hannah's page, share Nadia's page. It all helps and it will all go towards that thing, which we have not given up hope for, Hannah, for you to get in her to and for thousands of other women to get in her to. Absolutely, and that's it. That's the real thing. It's not just, I don't, it is absolutely not just for me because I, probably walk away now knowing that I'm going to have a different treatment plan this I don't like injustice and I'm going to keep going because we all deserve the best possible treatments available to to be available to us and and not just for us but the people down the line who might all receive a heartbreaking diagnosis at some point we need to make sure that the best possible treatments are available for them too Hannah thank you so much for coming to meet with us again at this you know incredibly difficult time for you Thank we you. appreciate everything that you're doing and we will do everything that we can to to help get in her to for all the people who need it so lovely thank you so much for having me thank you do you feel that there is an imbalance between the treatment of secondary breast cancer patients and primary patients in terms of the drugs that are developed, the time that things take, the treatment, the attention, and how seriously we are taken as patients? I think in terms of the drugs that are available in research, I think it's really difficult to separate 
at the point of drug development and clinical trials separate what is for the good of primary patients and secondary patients. I think often in breast cancer trials, things will be tested on metastatic patients first. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's quite clear cut that um, we can't say only five, ten percent of whatever research or funding goes towards secondary cancer because it, it's all interlinked. There might be some instances of being quite clear as to what's being focused on, but it's not as straightforward. In terms of being taken seriously, I think I was quite lucky. Um, but maybe it's because I never got out of the hospital system with my like constant diagnoses. Mm. Um, I was taken seriously whenever I rocked up and said, I've got, you know, a pain in my underarm um, and I was scanned but I know that isn't the case for everyone I know that some people do have to push further but again is it does that come down to awareness of the symptoms of secondary breast cancer in both the patient population and GPs um, yeah I don't know I don't know I think that yeah I, I definitely think there is a an, an awareness um exercise that needs to be done and certainly I know Breast Cancer Now is working on that as are yeah. other charities and bodies yes. but in terms of educating both health healthcare professionals and people who have had cancer yeah. of the signs and symptoms yeah. of secondary breast cancer because and it's difficult because there are so many things that you can feel like fatigue and yeah. breathlessness that or whatever that actually quite general yeah. yeah could be from the cancer treatment that you've had or from the yeah. menopausal s symptoms or so many other things but yeah. I think it's just really important for people who have had cancer ever to be mindful of any changes absolutely that are anything in their new body. that persists and can't be explained away yeah get it checked out for sure I always say that it's like it's good to continue to be breast and body aware even after a primary diagnosis yeah, absolutely if people are interested to follow you or find out more about your campaigning and your work where's the best place to find you uh, they can follow me on instagram at real house of hannah it's a really really random name um but yeah i will admit that i'm not someone who posts very frequently because I am very much trying to be in the moment with my family. But yeah, you can check in there. And I, I do answer DMs if there's any other questions, particularly about trials and other things. So that's where you'll find me. That's okay. And we don't have to apologise about being on and off uh, sporadic social media I think it should be the new because... way. I think there's something in it, right? Speaking of enjoying life, yes. you are a diehard Spice Girls fan. Oh my God, yes. Who is your favourite Spice Girl? Um, Jerry. Oh. <laughs> Who's yours? Oh, um, sporty. Oh, I was yeah. always a sporty. I was always sporty too, but I always wanted to be Ginger Spice. <laughs> she was like the, you know, the cool one, the cheeky one, the gobby. I was neither, none of those things. So it's like kind of like looking up to someone wanting to be a bit like that. But yeah, no, I absolutely adored the Spice Girls. Yeah. The Spice Girls became famous for girl power, which I think is something you have in spades. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to reword the question that we ask at the end of this podcast to everyone. If you had the power to change one element of breast cancer diagnosis and treatment within the next few years, what would it be? Ooh, that's a big one. If I had the power to change one element of it, so just one thing, can I change its existence? Sure. Yeah, there. Absolutely. It That's what the Spice Girls would do. It doesn't exist. There we are. It's think, gone. Yeah, I think that might be the best answer we've had to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go straight in. Why, let's not mess around. Like, yeah. Let's get right, cut the head of the snake. It no longer exists. Forget That's about I, in her too. Exactly. Just get rid of Forget, cancer. Get rid of cancer. Yeah. That's a great one. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for joining us on the Breast Cancer Now podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> If you would like to help with the urgent campaign to get an her to available in England for Hannah and for other patients around the country, please visit the link in our show notes to write to your MP to sign the Breast Cancer Now petition and to share that petition far and wide. This is an urgent campaign and we need your help. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of the Breast Cancer Now podcast, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please also leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and perhaps recommend it to someone you think would find it helpful. The more people we can reach, the more we can get Breast Cancer Now's vital resources to those who need them. You can find support and information on our website, breastcancernow.org, 
And you can follow Breast Cancer Now on social media at Breast Cancer Now. All the links mentioned in this episode are listed in the show notes in your podcast app. Thank you for listening to the Breast Cancer Now podcast. Thank you.